It's all around us these days as all of us, our friends and families, enjoy the mind and body benefits, the thrills and spills of sports. Photographer John Bath tells us how our cameras can get in on the action. You know, good action photographs can really be taken with virtually any type of camera. But if you have a 35 millimeter camera with interchangeable lenses, you're going to have a lot more flexibility in your action picture taking. Another important key is the film that you choose. Generally, action pictures are taken with high speed films. If you're indoors photographing a basketball game, for example, you'll need an extremely fast film, maybe Coda Color VR-1000 film. Or if you're outdoors on a nice day like today, well, VR-400 film would do the trick. Now make a friend of your camera's instruction manual. There is a wealth of information inside these books. And if you forget some of the terms that we use during the program, look them up in the manual. Chances are there's a good explanation for you. A long lens is a tremendous benefit to sports photographers. A 200 millimeter lens or a zoom lens that goes up to 200 millimeters can help bring those distant scenes closer for a lot more impact. It's also going to help you stay out of the way of the competitors. Isn't that a familiar sound? That power winder or motor drive is a great aid in action photography because it helps you capture more than one shot of some fleeting moment. And don't forget to bring along a lot of film. Really, you hate to run out of film when that action just starts to get exciting. You'll probably have to take many pictures before you capture just the right composition of the action at its most exciting point. You know, people have long been the favorite subject of photographers, but people involved in action give us that rare opportunity to capture a true slice of life. Set. No matter what sport you're photographing, it's good to know the capabilities as well as the limitations of your equipment. Let's start by demonstrating the effects of different lenses. Now, Dan, we'd like to take a series of pictures with different focal length lenses as you're coming over the hurdles. I'm actually going to be taking your photograph as you come over the second to last hurdle. So I don't care where you start the course, as long as you look good as you come over that second to last hurdle, we'll be all set. Okay, why don't you head down and get ready? You know, being familiar with your equipment and the various focal length lenses that are available to you, is very important to getting good action pictures, but it's also helpful to be familiar with the sport that you're photographing. In this particular case, I'm going to mark off 45 feet from that second to last hurdle, and I'm going to set down my tripod, and we'll change to different focal length lenses to show you the effect from 45 feet away. First, I'm going to use a wide angle lens. Now, a wide-angle lens will give us a wide angle of view, but from 45 feet away, the subject's going to be very small in the picture. As we go through these pictures with different lenses, pay attention to the depth of field in each photograph. Depth of field simply refers to the range of sharpness in your picture. Yes, we're focused on the second to last hurdle, and that's going to be tack sharp, but there's also a distance in front of that hurdle and a distance beyond the hurdle that are going to be acceptably sharp. And that range from the near side out to the far side is called my range of sharpness or depth of field. Wide angle lenses give you tremendous depth of field. See what I mean? We have a great range of sharpness with the 25 millimeter lens, but you can hardly see the hurdler. Now let's change from our wide angle lens to a 50 millimeter lens, a normal lens. Now a normal lens will give you approximately the same angle of view that you normally see with your eyes. It's a slightly narrower angle of view than you see with a 25 millimeter wide angle lens, but the image size is larger. How much larger? Well, we've doubled the focal length from 25 to 50 millimeters, so we've doubled the image size. Okay.
Now the hurdler is twice as big, but I still think we can do better. Any lens longer than a normal lens would be considered a telephoto lens. This 105 would be considered a medium telephoto. With a 105, since we've doubled the focal length from a normal, we've doubled the image size once again. It'll look like the subject is closer to the camera, even though we're still 45 feet away. Personally, I think the 105 is one of my favorite focal lengths, because really it doubles as a portrait lens if I want to move in close to take head and shoulder close-ups of the athletes. Ah, now the hurdler is becoming the center of interest, making the picture much more interesting. Many excellent pictures are ruined because of camera movement, and this becomes especially noticeable with telephoto lenses. Now, with the camera mounted on a tripod, it's really no problem, but the general rule of thumb is if you're hand-holding the camera, you should have a shutter speed at least equivalent to the focal length of the lens. I've got a 200 millimeter lens on the camera right now. If I was hand-holding the camera, I would set my shutter speed at least at a 250th of a second or faster. Okay. With this lens, we're isolating our subject even more from the surroundings because we have a much narrower angle of view. A 500 millimeter lens will yield the shallowest depth of field of all of the lenses that we're showing you. But that's kind of exciting because now we're going to isolate the subject from both the foreground and the background. A 500 also gives a feeling of compression. It'll look like the hurdles are stacked up on top of one another rather than being spread out along the track. Okay. Look at the intensity of his expression, the concentration of the action, and the composition that fills the entire picture frame. The 500 millimeter lens was probably the best choice from this distance. From 45 feet away, that 500 millimeter lens looks great but you'll probably agree that that 25 millimeter lens wasn't very exciting. Let's look at a little more imaginative way to use those wide angle lenses. With the cooperation of the hurdler during a practice session, I put my camera on a small tripod, selected a low angle very close to the hurdle, and then focused slightly above the top of the hurdle. A long cable release enabled me to stay out of Dan's way. same technique can work for a variety of situations, even for vertical compositions. Panning is a very effective way to stop motion with slower shutter speeds. Another advantage of panning is it helps separate your subject from the background. Now the basic principle of panning is that you're moving the camera in the same direction and at the same rate of speed as your subject. Probably more so than any other photographic technique, panning will effectively convey the feeling of action. Watch the legs and arms of the runners as we pan at three different shutter speeds a 250th of a second, a 60th of a second, and a 15th of a second. Which is best? Well, that's for you to decide. If you like the blurred motion you get with panning with a very slow shutter speed, and you're working in bright sunlight, you may find it helpful to add a neutral density or polarizing filter to the front of the lens. These filters will cut down the amount of light entering the lens, enabling you to use those slow shutter speeds. There are all kinds of events at a track and field meet. Get in the habit of looking at the action from all angles. Crouch down low. Choose an angle that captures the arch of the high jumper's back. Walk around to the other side. Or use different lenses to capture different perspectives. A 
high jumper caught at the height of his jump is a good example of action frozen at its peak. Such moments of suspended motion occur in many activities when a person abruptly reverses direction. To be prepared, first pre-focus your camera. In this case, I'm going to pre-focus just slightly above the high bar. Preset the exposure. I took a close-up reading of the jumper. And then anticipate the action. Start releasing that shutter just before the subject reaches his peak. Everybody knows somebody who's involved in an active sport. These young motocross stars spend almost as much time preparing for the big event as they do scrambling through the hills. John uses that prep time for picture taking. He also scouts the course for the bumps and curves on which he'll pre-focus his camera during competition. It's true that one picture is worth a thousand words, and good action photographs are perhaps the best example. Excitement, tension, competition, skill, danger, and of course speed can all be conveyed with a single still photograph. Sometimes motion is best expressed in a still photograph by freezing the action, isolating that split second of time where dynamic motion is frozen at its most exciting point. Subjects caught in midair, or subjects leaning over so far they seem to defy gravity. Probably the most common technique for freezing motion is by the use of a very fast shutter speed. If you choose a speed as high as a thousandth of a second, you can stop the motion of almost any rapidly moving subject. With good action photographs, a sense of timing is absolutely critical. First, we're going to pre-focus on the point where we think the action is going to be most exciting. It only takes our brains a fraction of a second to tell our finger to push the shutter and for the shutter to actually release. But sometimes that's too long. Sometimes we've missed the picture. What you have to do is anticipate when the action is going to reach its peak and actually start pressing the shutter just before the action gets there. Look for unusual angles and use different focal length lenses in your action photographs. For example, you may want to choose a really long lens, like a 500 millimeter lens. Stand a fair distance away from your subject, pre-focus on the jump, and compress the action as the racers come flying over the jump. Or you may want to choose a wide angle lens, maybe something like a 28 millimeter lens, and shoot from a very low angle. It will look like your subject is flying through the sky. When you're preparing for your action photographs, take your meter reading in advance. But make sure that that meter is not influenced by a very bright or a very dark background. For example, if you're using a wide angle lens and you're down low and you're photographing a subject up against a bright sky, sometimes you could obtain a false reading. Tip that camera down. Take your reading off of the ground rather than off of the bright sky. You'll get a much more accurate exposure. Each sport has its own challenges, and water skiing is no exception. Not only do we have a fast-moving subject, but that subject speeds across water, a surface that introduces its own special set of challenges. Even a photographer who never gets into a boat can meet those challenges with a little pre-planning and a basic understanding of how to follow and stop action. John also uses knowledge of the sport of water skiing, its specialized equipment, and its watery outdoor setting to help him take spectacular action shots. When you're taking pictures on the water, you can usually get more accurate exposures by taking a substitute reading off your hand. Simply hold your hand up in front of the camera, and as long as your hand is in the same type of light as your subject, the exposure will be accurate. Now, if you were to take an exposure reading of your subject out there on the water, sometimes the highlights off the surface of the water can cause a false reading. Oftentimes, you can get some excellent pictures from the dock, but if you have an opportunity to ride in the ski boat, you'll have even greater control. To get that spectacular shot, that split second as the skier carves his turn around the buoy and sends the spray flying, you're going to need an extremely fast shutter speed, maybe a 500th or a thousandth of a second, so you can stop the motion of the boat and also stop the motion of the skier. To capture this dramatic close-up, 
I used a 500 millimeter lens, a 2,000th of a second shutter speed, and 1,000 speed film. One other thing to be aware of is the quality of light. Early in the morning and late in the evening are probably the two best times of day for just about any kind of photography. At these times, the sun is low in the horizon, and it skims across the water and creates a feeling of texture and dimension in the pictures. We talked about basic panning techniques a little while ago while we were at the track. Since panning is such an effective way to photograph action, let's go into a little more detail. Now, panning is a technique where you're actually moving the camera at the same relative speed as the subject. Although panning is probably one of the more difficult photographic techniques to use successfully, it definitely yields the most exciting action pictures. Good panning pictures require relatively slow shutter speeds, so this is probably a good time to use slow speed films, maybe a 100 speed film. In this particular case, I'm using a 60th of a second shutter speed. Now you pre-focus the camera on the spot where you would like to take the picture. Then establish a good solid base, twist the upper half of your body towards the direction from which the subject will come, and then as soon as the subject appears in the viewfinder, follow it, release the shutter at the pre-selected spot, and follow through. And that's the key to a good successful pan shot, is the follow through. It has to be one smooth, continuous motion from start to finish. Practice it a few times before the subject even goes by. Sometimes in very low light levels, panning is the only way to take good action pictures, because low light levels necessitate slow shutter speeds. And if you use a slow shutter speed and don't pan with the camera, the subject can be blurred, like this. In planning a shot, keep in mind that the closer you are to the subject, the more likely it is to blur. The same is true of subjects moving across your field of vision rather than approaching you head on. When I'm taking pictures of slalom skiers or jumpers from the boat, I usually like to have a long telephoto lens on the camera, maybe an 80 to 200 millimeter zoom lens. Also, because the standard ski rope is 75 feet long, focus is very easy. I can just pre-focus the camera 75 feet away, and I'm all set to go. Since the subject is a constant distance from the camera, we have an ideal opportunity to use a motor drive to get an entire sequence of action pictures. You know, in water skiing, we had to concern ourselves with those bright reflections off the water fooling the camera's meter. The same is true in snow skiing, maybe even more so because you have that huge white background behind your subject. And that bright white background can cause underexposure unless you compensate in some way. Now, the best way to get accurate exposures while you're on the snow is to move in very, very close to your subject and take a close-up reading off of their face. If that's not possible, well, then take an overall reading of the mountain and open up the camera lens by a stop and a half. You know, a lot of people are reluctant to take pictures in the cold weather. But for those of you that are skiers, you know when you get up on the top of that mountain, you're just going to see some beautiful, magnificent scenery, and you're going to wish you had your camera along. You really can take pictures when it's cold out, as long as you take just a few simple precautions. First of all, I just like to have my camera close to the body so it doesn't swing around when I'm skiing, and just a couple elastic straps will do the trick. Secondly, a nice accessory to have along is a fanny pack. I can carry my extra lenses and filters and film, as well as a plastic bag. Now the advantage of the plastic bag is that when I'm done taking pictures, I can put the camera inside the bag, seal the bag off, and then take the camera inside. Now when the camera's in the warm, moist air, the moisture will condense on the bag rather than on the camera. It protects the camera. 
select a good spot to make the best use of the lighting. If you know the skiers are going to be kicking up snow when they turn, well then backlighting would be a good choice. And make sure you watch that background to avoid distracting wires and poles. Get some friends together and plan a shot. Ski down ahead of them and select a good spot to shoot from. Get down low and photograph them head on with a long lens as they ski down behind one another. Or pan with them as they speed by. Indoor sports like basketball offer lots of photogenic action. John simplifies the task of shooting in lower light levels by choosing a higher speed film. Taking pictures at an annual sports festival such as the Empire State Games in Syracuse, New York, really provides us with an opportunity to photograph many different events. Even though all of the techniques we've discussed still apply when you go indoors, you'll quickly discover that you simply don't have as much light to work with. Indoor sports are perhaps the sports photographer's greatest challenge. At these games, I had an opportunity to move around the activity and try various angles. But if you're going to be photographing a professional event and you have to take your pictures from the bleachers, you want to bring along your long lenses. Long lenses are necessary to help fill the frame, but since they usually don't have very large maximum lens openings, it's difficult to obtain fast enough shutter speeds to help freeze the action. High speed film, like 1000 speed film, is a tremendous help in these situations. As a matter of fact, these films have opened up opportunities to get color pictures that simply weren't possible before. As we move from basketball to diving, we go from artificial light that looks dim to a combination of artificial light and daylight that looks brighter but really isn't. John positions himself so the windows behind him provide front lighting for split-second subjects that once again challenge his action photography technique. John doesn't wait to take one picture, but rather creates a photo series that tells the whole diving story from total concentration to all-important follow-through. The diver's story doesn't end in the water, and neither does John's picture story. These post-dive shots help him bring out the individual behind the performance. With a medal in the offing, there's yet another reason to take pictures. But this time, John's action subject relaxes and poses proudly for her photographer. John takes advantage of a practice session to try some unusual angles and some close-up camera positions. To expand on and support his best action shots, he's always on the lookout for the telling detail. At the start of a swimming race, tense athletes, getting ready to spring to life, stretch every muscle hoping to gain even the barest fraction of an inch advantage. Again, John adds a motor drive unit to his camera so that he can capture the continuity of the swimming action. To compensate for the pool's low light levels, he also seeks out and finds an extra photographic edge. I noticed the swimmers in lanes 7 and 8 were passing through patches of sunlight coming in through a small bank of windows. By timing my shots to their passing through those patches, I was able to use a normal daylight exposure and a very fast shutter speed to stop the action. Gymnastics are rapidly emerging as some of the most popular sports for participants and spectators alike. The strength, flexibility, and control that gymnasts strive to achieve are the stuff of which great sports pictures are made. A still picture that suspends a gymnast in midair or captures her at the peak of her performance can be a satisfying achievement for anyone. John looks for naturally photogenic moments at the beginning and end of each gymnast routine. To capture highlights of a performance that ranges all over the mat, he pre-focuses on one spot and waits for the gymnast to come within his zone of focus. 
Gymnastic events that confine a competitor to a piece of equipment make it even easier to pre-focus the camera to anticipate and catch peak action. The challenge of wrestling lies in the brute strength of its competitors. John moves in close enough with his camera lens to capture all the contortions and yes, even the somewhat inelegant facial expressions of athletes who are giving all they've got. Well, there you have it. We may not have covered your favorite sport, but the techniques we've discussed really apply to any type of action picture. And it really doesn't even have to be a sport. Maybe the kids riding their bikes down the street or jumping into the backyard swimming pool. Just load up your camera with Kodakolor VR400 or VR1000 speed film and put some of these techniques to use. The reason most of us watch sports is for the excitement and the drama. But you know, when you go to the stadium and you're watching a game and you see a magnificent play down there on the field, sometimes by the time you've left the stadium, that play is just a blur to your memory. If you're quick with your camera and you catch that play, not only do you define it so that you can see it in more detail, but you preserve it for many, many years to come. Enjoy your photography. Practice it. Work with it. I think you'll find that action photography can provide some of the most exciting pictures you've ever made. Action scenes are certainly an exciting challenge. The critical peak of the action can last just a split second. You can relate that peak moment to a uh, bouncing ball. The ball actually stops moving for an instant before it changes direction from up to down. If you play tennis, you may have learned to time your strokes to connect with the ball at the precise moment when it reaches the peak of its arc. If you can time your photography that precisely, you'll be pleased with the results. That peak moment is often the most dramatic and the most graceful. It may seem strange, but picturing that instant when there is no motion can actually communicate the strongest impression of motion. Experience has taught us that what goes up also comes down. To capture that brief moment, you need to be prepared. If you have to think twice about how to photograph a scene, the action may pass you by. On the other hand, when you have control of the tools and techniques, you can do more than record the peak of the action. You can add visual impact by using different angles and lenses to express the dynamic drama of the action. You can visually highlight a sense of speed or power or graceful balance. You can interpret the human element, the effort and intensity involved in action and competition. Of course, the first step is to become familiar with the basic photographic skills you'll need. This program can help. Watch it again. And next time, have your camera handy so you can practice pre-focusing and panning. The more you review this program, the better prepared you'll be to capture those special moments that make great action pictures.